Galatians chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 16 through 25. This is our final week together in season one of Shepherd School, and we're still in our section on pneumatology. Pneumatology, that is the doctrine of God the Holy Spirit. And where we're going to finish our weekly meetings together is the fruitful work of the Holy Spirit. We've looked at the empowering work, we've looked at the promised work, we've looked at the gifting work, that He gives spiritual gifts to believers, and now we're going to examine this particular passage that deals with the fruitful work of the Spirit, namely, we mean the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in the lives of believers. But we're not only going to look at these lists or this particular list of the fruit of the Spirit, you've got to look at everything surrounding it. So I ask these few questions by way of introduction before we dig into this. What is the Holy Spirit doing in your life as a believer? If you're a believer, what is the Holy Spirit doing? You certainly have asked something like that before, and you may have not named that particular person in the Trinity, but you might be thinking, what is God doing? I just want to know what God is doing in me. What is He trying to do? Or something like that. Well, that question is answered in this passage of Scripture. This is what God the Holy Spirit is doing in you. What is your... Another question is, what is your still indwelling sin doing in your life as a believer? What is happening within me that I am still not perfected I'm united to Christ. I've been given God the Holy Spirit. I've been baptized in the Spirit. I'm forgiven of my sins because of what Christ has done in His death and resurrection. I'm reckoned righteous before God with the imputed righteousness of Christ. And I still have indwelling sin. What is your indwelling sin doing in your life? That question is answered in this text of Scripture. And then it's also answered, so those two things are huge in this text. What is God the Holy Spirit doing in your life? What is your indwelling sin still trying to do in your life? And then what should I therefore do? How do I act accordingly? If this is what my flesh, my indwelling sin is doing, this is what God the Holy Spirit is doing, what then with that knowledge should I be doing in my prayers and my labors and as I read and study the scripture, as I go to the ordinances, what should I be doing? That is also answered in this text of scripture. And the doctrine that we learned here can be summarized like this. You must walk by the Spirit because if you are in Christ, there is a war raging in your chest. You must walk by the Spirit because if you are in Christ, there is a war raging in your chest. If you want to add these last words, that war is between the Holy Spirit and your sinful flesh. So again, all of it together. You must walk by the Spirit because if you are in Christ, there is a war raging in your chest between the Holy Spirit and and your sinful flesh. These truths that are contained in these verses right here that we're looking at, men, these truths are ones that you need to know. You need to have these down. These need to be memorized by you like the back of your hand. This is what the Spirit's doing in your life. This is what your indwelling sin is doing in your life. And this is what you then therefore need to be doing, given those realities. You need to know these truths and act upon them accordingly. These truths are also what you need to teach those who are in your charge. Your wife needs to know, if she is a believer, this is what God is doing in you. This is what the Spirit is doing. This is what your still indwelling sin is doing. And this is then therefore what you should be doing with those things in mind. This is what you need to teach your wife, your children, Christ's church, and this is assuredly what you need to know yourself. 
So listen and make notes. Listen and make notes for yourself, for your wife, for your children, and for Christ's church at large. Start with me. I'm going to point out eight specific things that we learn in this passage. Some of them are propositional statements of truth, and then a couple of them are questions that I'm asking because there are like 10 answers to that question. So rather than having a 30-point outline, we've got an 8-point outline and two of the specific points, which are questions, and they've got a lot of subpoints as we look at the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. So eight, eight major things I'm going to point you to, and we will make sure and go through every single one of these works of the flesh, and then we'll go through every single one of these, which are the fruit of the Spirit. But start with me first in verse 16, and notice the command of God through the Apostle Paul is, but I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. By the Spirit. That word walk is an imperative verb. You could even translate it, keep in step with the Spirit. It literally means walking is a metaphor used frequently in the Scripture for everyday, ordinary life. Walking, just like you put one foot in front of the other. The walking metaphor is live your Christian life like this. The reason it's walking is because it's not just huge, big picture stuff. It has to do with continual, everyday, one foot in front of the other Christian living. So he says, walk by the Spirit, by which he means God the Holy Spirit. There's a reason they capitalize the S in Spirit there in the English Standard Version, and it's for good reason. They're talking about this is what the Spirit is doing in you. That's what Paul is getting at. This is what... Your sinful flesh is doing in you. And before he even details all of those things, he says, this is what you need to know. You must walk by the Spirit. And then he finishes this section. I think verse 25 is actually the ending of this section. He says, if we live, look in your own Bible, verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, that means if you are in Christ, If God the Holy Spirit has regenerated you, you are a new creation in Christ. If you live by the Spirit who regenerates you, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. It's the same metaphor of walking, but it's even more particular that the Spirit is doing this. He's leading you in this way that He details in the verses previous. Because he's doing this, stay very close to him and walk right with him because this is what he's doing. This is where he's leading you. So keep in step with him. Keep on his heels because this is where he's leading you. So this passage is one that you should go to when people say things like, I just feel like the Holy Spirit is leading me to do this. Like, which fruit of the Spirit are you talking about? Because this is what he's leading you to do. This is what he's doing in you. And we shouldn't allow people to use the trump card of, this is what I feel that God the Holy Spirit is leading me to do. People do that a lot when it's really, at best, it's this is what I think is wise to do. This is what I think would be good to do. That's great. Just say that and get rid of this jargon that is so prevalent in modern evangelicalism. I I just feel like God is telling me to do this. Okay, I feel like God told me the opposite. So where are we going to go? Let's go to the scriptures and then make wise choices based on what God says in his word. You must walk by the spirit. What does that mean? Is that you just somehow yield yourself up and you feel like the spirit is leading you to do something. And that's what it means to walk by the spirit. Absolutely not. The spirit does not work in separation in leading believers from the Word of God. The Spirit of God leads through the Word of God. And this is why God the Holy Spirit is the one, typically the person of the Trinity, that is the one who sanctifies us. That's frequently in the Scripture, the Spirit of sanctification. The Spirit is sanctifying us. And this is why in Christ's high priestly prayer, He prays to His Father and He doesn't say, Father, 
sanctify them by the Spirit. But he says, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So you need to know that to walk by the Spirit means, and I think MacArthur puts it well, this indicates continuous action or habitual lifestyle. Walking also implies progress as a believer submits to the Spirit's control. That is, responding in obedience to the simple commands of Scripture. He grows in his spiritual life. To keep in step with the Spirit is to keep your nose in the Scriptures. That's what it means. The Scriptures reveal the will of God for your life. And God the Holy Spirit is the person, particularly of the Trinity, who helps you understand the Scriptures, who brings the Scriptures to your mind, who drives your eyes to continually go to Christ. As Christ said, He will take the things that are mine and give them to you. The Spirit's work is through the Word. And so get rid of any thinking that walking by the Spirit just means what do I feel like God the Holy Spirit is leading me to do. This is always in accordance with what God's Word says as the Spirit illuminates our minds, helps us understand it, and then He applies it to us and helps us understand this is what it looks like to live in obedience to what God says in His Word. But you don't need to try to make a fourth member of the Trinity, or you don't need to replace the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Scriptures. You need the Spirit's power and illumination to be able to walk in the way that you should walk. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Thomas Manton, in his sermon, even on these verses, points out this continual walking and obeying the simple commands of God in the Scripture that this is what the Apostle Paul is getting at. And he, I think, puts it beautifully to help us understand this walking, just as you're first learning to walk as a child, so it is when you're a baby Christian. You walk a few steps and you fall. You walk a few steps and you fall. And you bump into things and you don't know how to walk as you should. But as you grow up, it gets easier and easier to walk. So it is in the Christian life. Walking by the Spirit when you are a baby Christian is very difficult to keep walking by the power of the Spirit according to what the Scripture said. But as you continually put one foot in front of the other, it gets better and easier to actually walk by the Spirit. Manton says this, The more the Scripture is obeyed, the more it is strengthened. For the way of the Lord is strength to the upright, Proverbs 10.29. Manton says, The habits of grace increase by exercise. And the more godly and heavenly we are, the more we shall be so. And the more constantly we act grace, the more easily and readily we act it, and with greater pleasure and delight. This is a sure rule, Manton continues, that God rewardeth grace with grace. And remember, grace in the Scripture is not always, even as frequently used for the grace of God to save us from our sins and unite us to Christ. It's the gift or the empowering work of God the Holy Spirit. God rewardeth grace with grace. One duty is a help to another, and the sweetness and pleasure groweth upon us every day. Manton says, It is at, first, at the first yoking that the bullock is most unruly, and beginners are burdened with the toil of obedience more than grown Christians. Christ's yoke groweth more easy every day by the bearing. For the opposition is more broken, opposition meaning the lusts of the flesh, are more broken, and the experience of the sweetness and goodness of this way of righteousness is more increased. So maybe some of you just need to hear, walk by the Spirit in accordance to what God says in the Scriptures. It's not always as difficult as it is when you are an immature believer. It's not something that you're always like that toddler who can't walk. 
It is something. The yoke of Christ is upon us. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And it gets lighter and lighter and lighter. And you will come to delight more and more in your life in obeying Christ and walking by the Spirit. You must walk by the Spirit. There's the imperative that controls everything. And he says, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Look at the second part of verse 16. And this is the second truth you should glean from this text of Scripture. You must walk by the Spirit. Because that is the only way to keep away from fulfilling the lusts of your indwelling sin. You must walk by the Spirit, yielding yourself up to the Spirit's power as you study and labor to apply the Scriptures in obedience to God's commands. Walk by the Spirit because that is the only way to keep away from fulfilling the lusts of your indwelling sin. Notice he puts them. I say, walk by the Spirit, and if you do that, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So men, you need to have that very clear in your mind and make it clear to your wives and your children and all in your charge that putting sin to death is not just I'm constantly thinking about sin as much as it is I'm constantly thinking about Christ and feasting on His Word and praying that God the Holy Spirit would enable me to love Christ and delight in Christ and walk by the Spirit. And as you're walking by the Spirit... At that time, you're not going to be gratifying the desires of the flesh. Or the, it's the word epithumeo, which doesn't just mean desires, it means lusts. The lusts of your sinful flesh. The word flesh here is used for indwelling sin, what we would call indwelling sin. Sometimes that word sarx is used to to distinguish between something spiritual and something physical, like a human body can just be called flesh at times. But in this context, he's using it for these lusts of the flesh, your sinful desires coming from your still indwelling sin. So you need to know if you want to be putting your sin to death, the answer is not just simply, I'm always focusing on sin and thinking about sin. But it's more, I'm always focusing on Christ and thinking about Christ and feasting on the Scriptures and asking God the Holy Spirit to help me delight to obey Him. And if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. This is what Thomas Chalmers called the expulsive power of a new affection. You have that new affection that you're continually working on for Christ and that expels the desires of the flesh. When you're loving and delighting in the Lord Jesus Christ, the lusts of the flesh, when they come up within you, they, they just seem stupid. They're not going to profit me. Christ delights me far more than indulging in my lusts of the flesh do. But this is why you must walk by the Spirit. Looking to the Scriptures, depending on the Spirit to give you power, because doing that, you will not gratify. You won't perform the lusts or the desires of the flesh. Then he says in verse 17, for, that means because, the reason he's saying walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. In the Greek it's, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. The reason that word desires is not used again in the Greek is typically because epithumeo, that desires of the flesh, is not a word that you would necessarily use for what the Spirit is doing in you. So the desires, the lusts of the flesh, are against what God the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. And the Spirit is against the lusts of the flesh. That's what Paul's saying. The third truth that you need to learn particularly from verse 17, is that you must walk by the Spirit because there is a war raging in your chest between the Spirit and the flesh. You must walk by the Spirit because there is a war raging in your chest between the Spirit and the flesh. He says, look further in verse 17. For, again, because these... 
These, the, the spirit and your sinful flesh, these are opposed to one another. They are contrary to one another. They are adversaries. They are enemies to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And Paul, brilliantly, he's saying they keep you from doing the things you want to do, but he applies that to both the flesh and the spirit. The spirit is keeping you from fulfilling the lusts of the flesh that your flesh wants to do, and that Paul can even properly say that you want to do. The spirit is contrary to your lusts of the flesh to keep you from doing what you want to do in your sin. And in the same way, the lusts of the flesh are against what God the Holy Spirit is doing in you to keep you from doing what you do want to do in righteousness and you want to obey Christ and yield yourself up to the Spirit. So he can say both applies. These are opposed to one another. These are contrary and they keep you from doing what you want to do. And if you were to say, stop, Paul, what, what do you mean? What does a Christian want to do? Does a Christian want to sin? Or want to walk in the commands of God by the Spirit? And he would say, yes. And say, yeah. At times you want to indulge in your sinful flesh because you have indwelling sin. And you sometimes want to gratify those. And he would say, but yes also because of you being a new creature filled by God the Holy Spirit and Him working in you, you want to obey the commands of God and delight in Christ. He would say yes to both of those. And that's why he's saying you must walk by the Spirit because I know there are times you want to indulge the flesh and I know there are times you want to obey Christ. And I know the deepest desire of your heart as a Christian is you want to delight in and obey Christ. So you must walk by the Spirit as you look to the Scriptures so that you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The Christian life is war. You need to be reminded of that, and I'll try to remind you of that as often as I can. It's not only that the Christian life is war in the Ephesians 6 sense of there's powers and principalities, demonic forces, lies that are constantly told outside of us, and we have to destroy those and take every thought captive to obey Christ. It's not only that. There is a war inside each and every one of your chests. Only if you're a Christian. There's no war if you're not converted. Satan rules you. Your lusts, the desires of your flesh, are on the throne if you are not in Christ. But if you are a believer, there is a spiritual battle. It's raging, and that is why you must walk by the Spirit. Two contrary principles within you, what the Spirit is doing and what you in your sin, because of your indwelling sin, want to do. What he calls the lusts of the flesh. So you must walk by the Spirit. You must walk by the Spirit because that's the only way to keep away from fulfilling the lusts of your indwelling sin. And you must walk by the Spirit because there is a war raging in your chest between the Spirit and the flesh. But look what he does in verse 18. This is an incredibly intense passage of Scripture. And I think Paul, in writing this, knows it. He said those three things that I've already pointed out to you. And then he interjects verse 18 so that you and I and the first readers would not despair and just go, Oh my gosh! That's true. Sometimes I want to fulfill the desires of my flesh. Sometimes I want to obey Christ. i got to walk in the Spirit. There's a war raging in me. And then he interjects verse 18 and reminds us of this truth. Though the war rages in Christ, you are not under the law's curse. That's what he means. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law, by which he means under the law's power to damn you and condemn you because you are a lawbreaker. If you are in Christ, you are led by the Spirit. And if that's true for you, this war is raging, but you're not under the law's curse any longer. He interjects verse 18 to lift our chins up 
and get us back looking to Christ and remember that Christ Jesus sacrificed Himself in our place to free us from the condemnation that is owed to us for our law-breaking. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Look at me, men. That verse, verse 18, is used by, I don't care what they call themselves, by antinomians, anti-law people, to say what the Christian life looks like is not as much looking to the law of God, but it's just being led by the Spirit. So if I'm led by the Spirit, I don't need to look to the commands of God because the Spirit tells me what I should do. That is absolutely not what the Apostle Paul is getting at in verse 18. He's talking, he's interjecting this as a way to say, you're not under this condemnation anymore. Listen to what Thomas Manton says. And it seems that people even said that in the 17th century when Manton lived because he attacks that very idea and that bad interpretation saying, you're not under, you don't need to listen to the commands of God anymore. The Spirit will just tell you what you should do. Listen to what he says. This walking in the Spirit gives us an evidence of our interest in the grace of justification. He's saying that we walk in the Spirit and want to obey the commands of God. That helps us understand that we actually are justified. Not by our works, but that is evidence that God has united us to Christ and we are justified. Galatians 5.18 he quotes, If ye be led by the Spirit, ye are not under the law. He continues, Not to be under the teaching of the law as a rule of obedience is impossible for a creature. He knows that some people take that and say, you're not under, this means you're not under the law as your teacher for how to obey Christ. He says, that is actually impossible for a created being. Not to be under what God says is right and wrong. He says, it is impossible for a creature to challenge such an exemption and point of right is to make ourselves gods. To say, I don't need to listen to the commands of God. I don't need to obey the moral law of God in my Christian life. He said, that's you making a law. You've become a law unto yourself and you're trying to make yourself a God. And he continues. He doesn't even stop. To usurp this in point of fact is to make ourselves devils. To say, I don't need to follow the law of God in obedience, and that's what Paul means here. He says, that makes you a devil. Then he continues, it must be meant, therefore, either of the irritating or condemning power of the law. If of the former, if it means the irritating power of the law, as the law by the rigid exacting of obedience doth increase sin rather than subdue it, and makes corrupt nature spurn and rebel against it. So it is the same with the former motives, but that is a more limited sense. Not under the law, this is what Manton, he's saying, that's one possible interpretation, the irritating nature of the law, that every time you don't obey it perfectly, it just irritates you, and it actually then makes you sin all the more, because it stirs you up unto that. But then Manton says what he thinks it means, and I think he's right. Not under the law may be expounded to be not under the condemning power of it. And so to be under the law is opposed to being under grace. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. There is a great privilege, but what is the qualification? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That is, obey. I think he's exactly right. Verse 18 doesn't mean you don't need to look to the law of God as your teacher for how to obey Christ. He's interjecting verse 18 because he knows you and I and the first readers are trembling, just going, oh my gosh, I gratify the desires of the flesh a lot. God's going to kill me. He said, I have to walk by the Spirit. And if I'm not walking by the Spirit, I will be gratifying the desires of the flesh I desire, I, I gratify the desires of my flesh a lot. Therefore, I'm not walking by the Spirit like I should be. The terror, the condemning power of the law begins to come, on, come down on you as you go through this text. And then he interjects verse 18 and he says, you're not under the law's curse. Man, you need to know, if you are in Christ, 
you are not free from the duty of the law. Oh, but you are free from the damnation of the law because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. The Puritans would talk of the law in this sense, and they called it the law of God in the hand of Christ. And that, that was their way of trying to bring this image that our walking in obedience to the law of God, we must never forget that the Lord Jesus, with his nail-scarred hands, is the one holding it and saying, this is how you obey me, this is how you glorify me, and that you never forget that his imputed righteousness is yours. His death replaces yours. You are free from the condemning power of the law because the law is in the hand of Christ. And that's how you need to see it as well. You are free from law's damnation, but don't for a second think that you live the Christian life free from the duty of the law. I don't even need to go into the countless examples of modern day charismatics who say verse 18 means that, and they just live their life. I think the Spirit is leading me to do this. And the sad thing is that it's not just charismatics or charismaniacs, it's many Baptists. It's many Presbyterians who say things like, I think God is leading me to do this. That's not what this verse means. You must look to the Scriptures and have necessary consequence derived from what God says, and that's how you can say things like, I think this would be good to do. And you show that you care to honor the Lord and the word of the Lord when you say things like that, rather than trying to play the trump card. I think this is what God's leading me to do. Don't play that trump card. It should not work. Any solid Christian man should call you on that and just say, yeah, maybe phrase it a different way. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? And if they can't say, well, because God says this, and I'm looking at my life, I think this is a wise decision. If they can't say that, then say, God's not leading you to do that. So stop saying he is. I digress. Let's move on to the fifth truth that we learn in this passage. And it's really a question that will be answered as we look at these works of the flesh. Remembering the whole context, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires or lusts of the flesh. And now, in verse 19, what he's answering is, what do the lusts of the flesh look like when they become the works of the flesh? What do the lusts, the temptations, the desires of the flesh look like when they're not lusts anymore, but they become the works of the flesh? Do you see how he even changes the word that he's using in verse 19? Now the works or deeds, the doings of the flesh are evident. They're clear. They're manifest. They're plainly recognized. That's what he means. He uses works in verse 19, and then you can see back in verse 16 and 17, he uses lusts. So what he's answering for us is what does it look like when the lusts of your indwelling sin become the works of your indwelling sin, and you act on them. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Look at verse 19. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Men, before we go through each of these and I explain to you what they actually mean, because some of them, you could look at it and go, doesn't that mean the same thing as what he just said? There's particular words and they mean particular things and we're going to work through that. But you need to know going into this, when you look at the works of the flesh, what God is doing and teaching you through the Apostle Paul is this is what your indwelling sin is trying to get you to do. This is what your indwelling sin is doing in you, tempting you with the lusts of the flesh so that you would gratify them and they would become the works of the flesh. 
you need to know your enemy. Know your enemy. Know what your greatest enemy is doing within you. You're still in dwelling sin. So that you can know your enemy, you can name your enemy, and you can cut the head off of your enemy. If you don't know your enemy, you don't know who to fight or what to fight. And so, look, look at these with me. We'll go through each of them. And I've got them separated up into three different categories even, which I think Paul does as well. The first are the sexual works of the flesh. This is the first three that he mentions. The sexual works of the flesh. And this, I think, Paul even mentions at the top because I think experience even shows us today these are the lusts of the flesh that dominate many men. These are the lusts of the flesh that are most coming up and tempting us to gratify them even as Christian men. The first one, porneia, sexual immorality. It's the Greek word from where we get our English word pornography. It's a junk drawer term, they call it, meaning it means any and every kind of sexual activity with your body or in the mind that is outside of the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman. Sexual immorality covers it all. So adultery, fornication, homosexuality, bestiality, prostitution, whatever it may be, whatever is outside of the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman, whether it be with your body or in your mind, in your heart, that is what sexual immorality is. That's the first in his list. There's a work of the flesh. There's an enemy. That's what your indwelling sin is trying to get you to turn from a lust of the flesh into a work of the flesh. Second, he mentions impurity. Impurity is just sexual impurity or uncleanliness. Sexual impurity or uncleanliness. Paul is using words that they do have a lot of overlap, but he's using repeated language to just hit every kind of angle he can hit, especially when it comes to sexual sin. Romans 1.24 says that God gave them up to impurity. God gave them up to impurity. And you know what the context, what Paul uses as the prime example of the depths of human depravity in Romans 1. It's homosexuality. Not only the men. He says even the women. Even the women. That's impurity. That's an enemy. The third, he says, is sensuality. Sensuality which there's overlap with porneia and impurity and sensuality, but this deals more with your inward inner lusts. This is unbridled lusts, unrestrained sexual indulgences. That's what sensuality means. This is evidenced, or a picture of this is in Genesis 19, when the angels come to Lot and the men of Sodom want to rape the male angels in Sodom. That is sensuality. That is unbridled lust. They're trying to knock down the door so that they can rape men. That's sensuality. There's the sexual works of the flesh. Know them, name them, put them in your crosshairs, and walk by the Spirit so that you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. This is what your sin wants to do in you and wants you to indulge in. Then the second category that he gets into is what I would call idolatrous works of the flesh. We've got sexual works of the, of the flesh, three of them in particular, and then he gives two idolatrous works of the flesh. First, he just says idolatry. Idolatry is... Not just worshiping in the sense that we typically use the word worship. Worshiping someone or something that's not God. What it means is trusting in or submitting to created things, whatever they are, rather than the creator. However formal the idol is or informal. Men today don't make as many formal idols, though there's plenty that you can see. Many of the idols of our hearts are 
informal idols. It's trusting in, looking to something or someone other than the Lord Jesus Christ to give you a sense of worth and value. That's idolatry. You can turn, as Calvin said, you can turn anything into an idol because the human heart is a perpetual factory of idols. Do you know that? Do you examine your own life? You see, a lot of times in our day, I think idols, especially among Christians, are good things, inherently good things that become ultimate things that we trust in and try to derive our worth and ultimate satisfaction from. So one of the best ways I think you can try to identify the idols in your life is not just looking at, one way you can look at it is, what do I want that if I don't get it, I feel like my life is just useless? That's a good way to identify that. What am I looking to, what do I want that if I can't get that or don't get that, life just doesn't really have meaning? That's one way to do it. But the better way to do it, and there's kind of two sides of the same coin, is look at the things in your life that if you lost it, that would you just wouldn't feel like you had a reason to live. What in your life that if you don't get it, you feel like you don't have the worth you need, or if you lost it, you are despondent, and you don't have the value that you used to have. That's idolatry. Trusting in, serving, created things rather than the Creator, however formal or informal. Name idolatry as your bosom enemy. And this is what your sin is trying to get you to do. But next he says, sorcery. How is it translated in your Bible? Who, who doesn't have an ESV? How's the LSB translated? Sorcery. All right. It's where we get our word pharmaceutical. This word sorcery, it came to be associated with things like witchcraft. I think the King James might even translate it witchcraft, something like that. That's not really what the word means. It became associated with pagan, demonic rituals like witchcraft, things like that. But MacArthur does, I think, a good job of highlighting what it actually means. Sorcery translates pharmakia. It's where we get our word pharmaceuticals and pharmacy. It was originally used of medicines in general, but came to be used primarily of mood and mind-altering drugs similar to those that create so much havoc in our own day. So you could actually just translate that word rather than sorcery. You could just translate it mind-altering and mood-altering drugs. But that would not be very popular today. I'll leave it to you to fill in the blank of the drugs that permeate our society and that many Christians even just take because some doctor said that they should take it. They're feeling really sad. Take this mind-altering and mood-altering drug. That's what you should do. That's how you fight depression. That's how you fight. That's how you fight being down. Properly speaking, that's uh, what the Scripture would call sorcery. Many ancient religious ceremonies, MacArthur continues, involved occultic practices in which drugs were used to induce supposed communication with deities. And pharmakia, therefore, came to be closely related to witchcraft and magic and sorcery. Aristotle and other Greek writers used the word as a synonym for witchcraft and black magic because drugs were so commonly used in their practice pharmaceuticals, mind-altering, mood-altering drugs. That's an idolatrous work of the flesh. Rather than yielding ourselves up to the Spirit and asking the Spirit to produce the fruit in us that He's promised to, like joy, peace, patience, many people run straight to pharmakia. And I think you need to examine that greatly in your own life and in the life of your family so that if you have to use drugs like that for anything, that you are very clear 
this is a case that it does need to be used for a short period of time. I'm not saying any kind of mood-altering or mind-altering drug taking it is always inherently sorcery, but I'm saying you need to be very careful and realize what the root of all of that is and that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, and that pharmakeia is a work of the flesh. There's idolatrous works of the flesh. Then he gets into what I just call, broadly speaking, relational works of the flesh and what your sinful flesh is trying to get you to gratify and turn into a work. Relational works of the flesh. We'll move more quickly through these. Enmity. That means hateful attitudes. It has to do with your attitudes. Just hateful. Strife. It means bitter conflicts. You're always bitter and you're always at conflict with other people. Jealousy. It means hateful resentment caused primarily by covetousness. Jealousy. It's hateful resentment of other people because you're coveting something that they've got in God's providence. Fits of anger, or what what is translated in some, wrath. This is not God's righteous wrath. This is man's sinful wrath. Fits of anger is a good translation. It means outbursts of anger. You're very quickly, you just become very angry at other people. That's a work of the flesh. Rivalries. What this word literally means is not like Oklahoma versus Oklahoma State. What this means is electioneering. Rivalries has to do, this word has to do with putting yourself forward as one that should be looked at and looked upon. It's like you're in election season and you're always putting yourself forward. Cast a vote for me even in your own mind. Rivalries, electioneering, putting yourself forward, especially over and against other people. Always comparing yourself to other people. That's electioneering. That's rivalries. That's a work of the flesh. Men, when you are tempted to think about the bad things that other people do, and then even in your mind, if it doesn't come out of your mouth, what you immediately do is think about the good things that you do In contrast to the bad things that they do, that is rivalries. That's a work of the flesh. That's electioneering. You're setting setting forth yourself over and against someone else. Next, he says, dissensions. This is disunity, to stand apart from others. Not just I'm willing to stand alone like Athanasius had to do, but I want to stand alone. I want to be seen as the only faithful person. Everyone else believes all this garbage, and I'm the faithful one. I'm the only one who gets it. And so you're dividing yourself from other people. You're standing apart from others because you are wise in your own eyes. That dissensions, that's what made Martin Luther pause for a day before he gave his famous speech, Here I stand, I can do no other So help me God. It's because before he goes into that, he's told by one of his friends, he said, Martin, do you really think you're the only one who's wise? And Luther had to go, oh no. Is that what's happening right now? Is that what I'm doing? Is that why I'm standing against the papists? And then that's particularly why he says, if I can be shown by the scripture or plain reason that what I have written is wrong, then I will recant. But unless you can show me that what I've written is in contradiction to what God's word says, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Luther was terrified to be in dissension, and so it made him even pause And he, before saying, here I stand. He says, can I have one day to think about it and to make sure He's not just saying, I'm the only one who gets it and all these dummies in the Roman Catholic Church don't know what's going on. But that's why he says, my conscience is captive to the Word of God. It's the Word of God that I'm standing up for, not my opinions or not my own wisdom. 
Because dissensions, to stand apart, it's a work of the flesh. Divisions is what he says next. If you're numbering, this is the seventh of the relational works of the flesh. Divisions. This is creating new sects. S-E-C-T-S. Creating new sects. It literally can mean capturing people. It's capturing people to be in your corner and your cause. That's what dissensions or divisions rather means. Creating new sects. So dissensions is everyone's an idiot. I'm going to stand alone because I'm the only one who is wise. And then divisions is, and now I'm going to go convince all these other people one by one to get them to come stand with me and I'm going to create my own thing. That's what divisions is and it is a work of the flesh. Capturing, capturing people and bringing them along with you. The eighth relational work of the flesh that he mentions is envy. This is spite, ill will towards other people. It is a sister to jealousy, but it more, it more has to do with you have a spiteful attitude towards others or ill will towards them. You do not hope things go really well for them, but you're actually really happy when things go badly for someone else, for particular people. That's envy. Then he says, ninth, concerning the relational works, drunkenness. This is being intoxicated. This is not just with wine. It's not just with beer. It's not just with whiskey. It's not just with alcohol in general. This could be with drugs in general. Anything that is mind-altering to the point of intoxication. Romans 13, 13 says, Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Drunkenness, being given over to numb your mind or to get loose in some way. That's a work of the flesh. And your flesh wants to do that and wants you to indulge in it. Then last, he mentions, tenthly, concerning relational works of the flesh, orgies. That means what you think it means. It means orgies. MacArthur, drunkenness and carousing probably had special reference to the orgies that so often characterize the pagan worship ceremonies that many of the Gentile converts of Galatia had once participated in. In a more general and universal sense, however, they refer to becoming drunk under any circumstance and to all rowdy, boisterous, and crude behavior that comes from it. Drunkenness and orgies are a work of the flesh. And then notice 11th, things like these. You just need to make a note. This incredibly long list is not exhaustive. This list is not exhaustive. So men, here are your greatest enemies. Your greatest enemy is not Satan. Your greatest enemy is not demons. Your personal greatest enemy is your still indwelling sin, laboring to get you to gratify its desires by turning them into works of the flesh. Set your sights on them. Know them. Name them. Don't have a disproportionate focus on them, though. You understand what I mean? Don't always be just focusing on sin or the works of the flesh. But when you are tempted, and in general, you need to know your enemy, name your enemy, set your sights on your enemy, but don't be constantly thinking about your enemy. You just need to know him when he appears so you can cut his head off with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Know them, teach them to your wives, teach them to your children, teach them to all who are in your charge. This is what your indwelling sin is trying to get you to do. Now look at our fourth fourth main point, and it also is a question. 
What if these works of the flesh are someone's habitual practice? What if these works of the flesh are someone's habitual practice? That is the question he's answering in the last part of verse 21. I warn you. Look in your Bible. I warn you. As I warned you before. That those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's the same thing that Paul says to the church in Corinth. Do you remember that when we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, two or three years ago? And he says, those who do this, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. By which he means the consummated kingdom, heaven, the new earth, the eternal state. This does not belong to those. It is evident in their lives, that they continually practice these things. That word, do, those who do such things, it's proso in the Greek, it means practice. It has to do not with, oh crap, I I slipped into this. Every believer will at times gratify the desires of the flesh, but the unbeliever lives in the desires of the flesh and constantly loves to fulfill them, to turn them into works. What Paul is doing is saying, I warn you that those whose habitual practice in their life are marked by this, they're not Christians, no matter what they say. Man, the reason that he can say that and the reason that your pastors of Ecclesia and Muskogee constantly say things like that, I'm sure you've heard me say things like that a lot. And the reason we do is because evangelicalism all around us is filled with professions of faith, people who say they're Christians, and this is their continual habitual practice. So why do they think they're Christians? Because they were told to come forward at an altar call and pray a prayer and ask Jesus into their heart, and you're a Christian. And they were not told that Jesus is not a wimpy Savior. The reason we constantly hammer this is because there are a lot of people who are deceived. And you need to make sure that you are not deceived. But it's, it's more than just making sure people aren't deceived in themselves. The reason we have to make that clear and the reason Paul, I think, makes this clear at the end of verse 21 is because if you think God has justified someone, He's imputed Christ's righteousness to Him, He's filled Him with God the Holy Spirit, He's given them a new nature, a new principle. He's written His law on their hearts so that they would be careful to obey all of the things that God commands them. That person continually lives like this? What you're saying is Jesus is a wimpy Savior and the Spirit is a weak sanctifier. The reason we have to make that point time and time again is because you and I should not be content with the Lord Jesus Christ being presented as a weak Savior who can save you from the penalty of sin, but He can't save you from the power of it. The Spirit can fill you so that you're led by the Spirit, whatever you think that means, but He can't sanctify you so that you would walk in the Spirit and not continually, habitually live in gratifying the desires of the flesh. Christ is not a wimpy Savior. Those that He brings to Himself, He changes. And those saints stumble into the mud. The wicked are the ones that roll in the mud. That's why He says, I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do, those who practice such things, they will be in heaven. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the answer to what if these works of the flesh are someone's habitual practice. Now we get to a happier part of this text. And the the question is, what does the fruit of the Spirit look like when one is walking by the Spirit? What does the fruit of the Spirit look like when one is walking by the Spirit? Look at verses 22 and 23 in your Bible. But the fruit, it's a singular word, it's not fruits, it, it's taken as the whole. It's, it's like it's in one bushel. 
And so though we distinguish between them as different fruit, we don't distinguish between them and just saying these are fruits. It's, this is the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in the lives of believers. But the fruit of the Spirit, that is God the Holy Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Man, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing in you, producing in you, if you are believers. You need to know what your sin is trying to do, and you need to know what the Spirit is doing and producing in you. To walk by the Spirit is to yield yourself up to what the Spirit is doing in you, in one sense. And to ask Him to continually produce this fruit in your life by His grace. Just pause Make sure I'm very clear. This list is not just, this is what you should be doing. That's not what Paul's primarily saying. He's saying, this is what the Spirit is doing in you. And so yield yourself up to it. And say, when, when these things happen, you even name it as, well, that's a fruit of the Spirit. That's what the Spirit has done in me. Praise God. Because that's not something I can cause to grow. That's something He causes to grow. But this is what you yield yourself up to knowing this is what He's doing in my life. And so you don't grieve the Spirit. You yield yourself up to what He's actually doing. Now let's go through each of these. Love is the first fruit of the Spirit that is named. Love. Love is willing self-sacrifice for the good of another. Willing self-sacrifice for the good of another. Don't interpret love any differently than that. You can phrase it differently if you want. Willing, it's sacrificial, and it's for what God calls the good of another. It's not whatever they call good. I think this would be good for me, you do this. No, that's not loving. Loving is good based on what God says is good. Willing self-sacrifice for the good of another. The reason I define it like that is because the Apostle John says in 1 John 3.16, By this we know love that Christ laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. What does love look like? Willing self-sacrifice for the good of someone else. That's what John says. That's what love is. And that's what the Spirit is producing in you. That you would be loving. He also then says joy. Joy. And I think joy gets interpreted in more abstract ways than it should because people are trying to make it like it's this transcendent, you can't explain it. Like, no, you can explain it. It means happiness. That's what joy means. It means happiness. It is a synonym. It's used synonymously in the scriptures. It is not just happiness. It is feelings of happiness that are based on spiritual realities. It's not just some abstracts like, I don't know, I'm just happy. It's not that, but it is happiness, feelings of happiness that are based on spiritual realities, namely who you are in Christ and who Christ is for you. It's joy. It's happiness because of who Christ is and that I get to be united to Him. Though you've not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. 1 Peter 1.8 This is what the Spirit is doing in you. Joy. When you're dour, when you're sour, when you're just like, you pride yourself in being just like, eh, whatever. Like, you're grieving the Holy Spirit because what He's doing in you is producing joy And maybe you've spent years grieving the Spirit who's trying to produce joy in you, and so you write it off as just like, I don't know, I'm just not a happy person. Well, if you're a Christian, you should be a happy person. Don't you have things to be happy about? Isn't Christ great? This is what the Spirit is doing in you. The third, he says, is peace. The Spirit is doing is producing peace in you. And this is not primarily you being a peacemaker, This is inner tranquility of mind. 
inner tranquility of mind that comes from being reconciled to God and having Him as your Father. This is the peace. It means you can go to bed at night and you can rest because you have a Father who has adopted you and who will not be sleeping while you sleep. He will be providentially working all things together for your good. It's that tranquility of mind. It's what Christ promised. John 14, He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace. My peace. I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You can go to sleep tonight and just hit the pillow and go to sleep and know that the Lord Jesus Christ who upholds the universe by the word of His power has accepted you. That's peace. That's what the Spirit is doing. He's applying those realities that have been purchased for us by Christ. He's applying them to us subjectively so that we actually think and live and feel like those are true because they are true. He's making it personal. But then fourthly, He says, patience. This is what the Spirit is doing in you, men. He's producing patience in you. This is being slow to anger, long-suffering. He says also kindness. He's producing kindness in you as a fruit. This word kindness simply means tender concern for other people. Tender concern for other people. Goodness, he says next. Goodness. This is virtue or uprightness of heart and life. Goodness is virtue or uprightness of heart and life. And that's what the Spirit is doing in you. He says next, faithfulness. Faithfulness. This is loyalty and trustworthiness. Faithfulness is not trusting in the promises. Faithfulness is being a loyal and trustworthy person. Are you loyal and trustworthy? That's what the Spirit is doing in you. Look next, he says, gentleness. Gentleness. In the New Testament, I think this is probably the most misunderstood fruit of the Spirit. Because what people think gentleness means is basically being effeminate. And that you don't really rebuke people or you don't, you don't have come to Jesus talks with people, but you're just, you know what? I just didn't want to offend anybody. That's not what this word means. Listen to the other ways this word is used in the New Testament. This Greek word is used to describe three ideas. First, submissiveness to God's will in Colossians 3.12. Second, being teachable in James 1.21. And thirdly, it's used in Ephesians 4.2, of being considerate of other people. Gentleness does not mean niceness. Gentleness does not mean that you're just, you just never offend anybody. It means being considerate of other people and knowing when to speak, when not to speak. It's not the same thing even as kindness. It's submissiveness to God's will, being teachable, being considerate of other people. Never used of God, properly speaking. It's only used of Jesus in His incarnation. And then lastly, he says self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Self-control means restraining your passions or appetites. Restraining your passions or appetites. You buffet your body and make it your slave. And this is what the Spirit is doing in you. So in some sense, there, there need not be things that we look at and say, well, I just, I just can't do that because, you know, I just go too far. Sometimes that's okay to say, and you're being wise to just stay away from something that could be the occasion of sin. But be very careful to act like this is not what the Spirit is doing in you. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. You can control yourself by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, because that is what He's doing in you. And then our last main point, our time is very much gone. 
Last main point. You need to know that the flesh is no longer a reigning power in you if you belong to Christ. Because by the Spirit, you continually crucify the flesh. That's what he means in verse 24. The flesh is no longer a reigning power in you if you belong to Christ. Because by the Spirit, you continually crucify the flesh. Verse 24 And those who belong to Christ Jesus. It's literally those who are Christ Jesus's. It's like those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Have crucified is a present, it's or it's an active rather. It's an active indicative. It's not past tense. What it means is are crucifying the flesh. Those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ are continually impaling their flesh with that splintered wood. He uses that same word of Christ being crucified for us and he says that's what mortifying your sin looks like. Those who belong to Christ are continually putting to death the works of of the flesh with its passions and desires. They are crucifying the flesh. You need to know that the flesh does not have reigning and ruling power over you anymore, but it does still have a residential address in your chest. So walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Men, know your enemy. Know what the Spirit is doing in you. Labor. Labor in light of those realities to keep your nose in the Scriptures, your knees bent in prayer, and asking the Spirit, do what you've said you're doing and enable me not to grieve you. Teach these things to your wives, to your children, to all those in your charge. And may we be men filled with the fruit of God the Holy Spirit and continually cutting the head off of the snake every time he comes up. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We ask you to produce the fruit of the Spirit in us. As you've said you are doing, as you've promised to do, enable us to continue to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires with the splintered wood of the cross. Enable us by your mercy to walk by the Spirit with our nose in the Bible, our knees bent in prayer, and following the Spirit's lead as he produces this fruit in us. Glorify yourself, sanctify us, help us to teach these things to those in our charge. In Christ's name, amen. All right, Jake, come.